supplement to your notes. I uh, draw your attention to the two definitions uh, on that supplement. The first is a definition of, a general definition of preservation. You notice that it doesn't necessarily limit itself to uh, the preservation of the scriptures, whereas the second one does. Um, a strong says preservation is that continuous agency of God by which he maintains in existence the things that he has created, together with the properties and the powers with which he has endowed them. In other words, he's talking about the material and the immaterial realities of all of his universe God is keeping them going. That applies just as much to people as it does to the scriptures. And uh, you know there are there are a larger much larger body of scriptures that teach preservation. Can you think of a verse that teaches preservation or something? This period. God keeps and preserves and protects that which he has made. Do you believe uh, in the security of the believer? Can you prove it from the scriptures? Where? <laughs> well, preservation of the believer in, in the realm of salvation is is part of the doctrine of preservation, generally speaking. So the you know, the eternal security of the believer, where's the verse that teaches that? Yeah, Second Timothy one twelve. Yeah. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I could read and I have written up it. That's Philippians one six, that's another one. Yeah. Oh, did he who began a good work in you will perform it. First Thessalonians 5.23, I pray God, Paul says, that your whole body and soul and spirit be preserved blameless unto the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Jude 1, Jude writes to those of like precious faith, preserved in Christ Jesus like pickle. Christ is like, uh, <laughs> you could use that, that'd be neat, uh, why don't you guys do this on Sunday mornings, why don't you just take it upon yourself to minister to those little kids by putting an object lesson, just pick something off the shelf like a jar of preserves, there it is, this is an object lesson, we're like the pickles in this jar, if the pickles weren't in the juice they wouldn't be safe, they'd be rotten, see, but they're in whatever that can preserve them, and we are in Christ, and because we are in Him, we're safe. Otherwise, we'd be dead. Mommy, you know those guys that call us your pickles? <laughs> yeah, we're pickles. Yeah. All right, so there are, I guess it's to be obvious that to you now that you think about it, that the doctrine of preservation is a general thing. Even, this, even the planet, Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, that all things Paul said, By him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. All together. So God is preserving the planets and the stars and the oceans and the polar ice caps. That's Colossians 1.17.
So to start with, when we are talking about the preservation of the scriptures, we should realize that this is only just part of the, the general working of God in the whole universe. He's preserving everything. He is allowing, by the way, the doctrine of preservation isn't contrary to the plan of God in which he is allowing the present earth to pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away, he says. That's, I preserved it with a built-in self-destruction factor in this particular element. As we know, the earth is passing away. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 7. He said the fashion of this world passes away. Right? But the scriptures are part of that which God has protected. That second definition alludes to that particular aspect of preservation. God's care and protection over his entire word from its revelation in time, through time, and eternity future. That's a very narrow definition of preservation with regard to our subject. And some of the scriptures that are listed on that sheet are the more obvious ones, and there are literally dozens that you could find in the scriptures. Psalm 19, the testimony of the Lord is sure, that is certain. Psalm 119, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled has been set in heaven. Now isn't that interesting? Psalm 119. Notice that verse. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled where? This happens to be one of the great mysteries of, now it depends on who you talk to, if you're talking to a King James Version fanatic, they believe that God's word is settled on earth in the King James Version. In my view, I'm not really sure, <laughs> you know, I can't point my finger uh, at a particular version and say, well, I know about that in every precise detail of God's Word, because I think the textual criticism, um, the, the science of comparing manuscripts, ancient manuscripts, shows us that, uh, that you can't do that. But however, I do believe that God's Word is settled in heaven. God knows where it is. But I'm not precisely certain. No. You may take issue with that, and uh, we're going to con continue that aspect of the study for a couple of weeks, because I haven't studied it out myself, but like I would like to, and I'd like to expose you to some of that stuff while we have the opportunity to talk about it. Okay. So the doctrine of version, uh, doctrine of preservations, and the versions question are intimately related. Right? If God has preserved His Word, then how come? Some manuscripts are different from other manuscripts. How come the version, the, the manuscripts that are basically to the King James Version of 1611, how come there are different manuscripts? So a person could make up a different Bible based on different manuscripts and not the same. So how can you say it's settled? Well, the Bible says it's settled in heaven. <laughs> God knows. Okay. Psalm 119, thou hast founded, that is, established and constituted the scriptures forever. God's eyes preserve or defend knowledge. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Matthew 5 says that it'll be, it'll never pass away until it's fulfilled. And it's the point is, I guess, is that it will be that the scripture is going to be continuously fulfilled forever and ever and ever. The promises that it makes, for instance, are going to find an eternal fulfillment. The familiar one in Matthew twenty four, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Hebrews twelve is an interesting passage. It categorizes everything in the world into two categories. He describes um, those things which cannot be shaken with the other. Now, let's turn to that, that, that paraphrase of simplifications and peace. Hebrews 12.
You would score 45, 29. Notice the emphasis on verbal speech in this passage. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refuse him that spoke in the, on the earth in the past, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then, that is in the past, shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. This word, Yet once more, quote unquote, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So in that verse he says that there are two categories. There are things that can be shaken and removed, and there are things that are that cannot be shaken and remain. Everything falls into those two categories. Wherefore, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, he says our salvation is like this, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. There's another office lesson for you. You can get one of those paint can shakers, <laughs> and... Uh, and you could latch, you could put a paint can inside the paint can shaker and plug it in and turn it on. And that paint can is getting the tar shaken out of it. You know, it's how, how many times it vibrates per second. Right, that'd be a really good illustration. Then you could take the paint can, paint can shaker and attach it to a uh, girder of this bridge down on the highway. <laughs> you know, or attach it to a tree. Okay, shake the tree. And you find that the, the paint can shaker is what gets shook it. Yeah. Or you could you could give the uh, kids a neat illustration of that. That sometimes even this earth is shaken, like San Francisco, right? So there, everything in this world is either shakeable and removable, or it falls into the other category. What is it, what, is, what is something? That, what are the things that cannot be shaken and removed? Our salvation, God, the scriptures. See? And we too, even though we are created, if we are in Christ, we cannot be moved. All right, so that's a that's an interesting passage of scripture. And, and because it occurs in the context of God's, uh, of the author referring to God's speech, that which God has spoken, it alludes to the fact that the scriptures are part of that which cannot be moved. And in 1 Peter 1, this word of God liveth and abideth forever and endureth forever. I'll give you a few references there for other aspects of preservation. To creation and people and beasts and life. I'm not going to go through the rational arguments for preservation. I'd, I'd like you to read through those, and if you, under, if you don't understand them or if you have a problem with them, be sure and ask uh, about them in tomorrow's class. What I would like to focus on is the history, that the history of the scriptures illustrate the fact that God has preserved his word. What was the first what is the first step? What was the first step in in God in in, in us having the scriptures? <laughs> what? Okay, now what um, well I'll break it down into the categories that we've already discussed. Okay, first God reveals inspires inspired it. Yeah, we'll just leave it in this step. So the first thing is God revealing. And the inspiring of it and the writing down of it is together. All scripture is inspired of God. That was his written. Okay? And then as soon as it was uh, recorded, what was it? What was it? No? 
pres preserved follows it. Although, well, it's, it's been preserved right from here. Because the next stage is like it's logical. Well, canonization. Yeah, it it is part of it. Then becomes part of the canon. Yeah, I didn't want to say that because I know it's official. Okay, the process. The canonization is a process, right? We all know that. Okay, so this happened many times, and whenever it was revealed and recorded, then automatically, it, in God's mind, it was part of His authoritative word. And it sometimes took many years to acknowledge that, or to receive it, or to overcome the objections to it, and stuff like that. So canonization is a process, and the very this this is a marvelous illustration of preservation, process of canonization. That it was the early Christians that had to decide whether James uh, James contradicted Romans, and whether Jude and Peter were duplications of one another. You know. Um, and whether or not the epistle of Hermas and Barnabas and Porphyry and you know all these other people, whether they should actually be included or what. And so for God to guide these people in their decisions regarding all the writings that were at their disposal, that's really a part of preservation. He was keeping his word from being lost in this process. Still part of preservation. Preservation even though we've left it last in our study of, the, of bibliology, is really an overarching doctrine. It applies to the revealing that when God spoke, preservation means that Moses didn't miss anything that God said. Neither did Paul. You know, he wasn't confused about it. Like, you know, he heard it, or he knew it, or he saw it. In one way or another, there was nothing missing in the actual transmission of the words from God to the man. Preservation also applies to this, and this is where textual criticism comes in. We believe that because there are thousands and thousands of Greek manuscripts and Hebrew manuscripts available for us today about the scriptures, that in those manuscripts we have God's written word, written down word, preserved for us. So preservation applies to the writing down of the scriptures. I think that's the answer. It's amazing. Uh, I'll get you the figures tomorrow. But uh, some of you might have heard of some ancient historians, um, yeah. Thucydides, um, okay. yeah, Socrates. Uh, well, some of these guys were more uh, philosophers than so uh, Plato's and Socrates. Yeah. Okay. Um, Rome. Well, anyway, this is the idea. Absolutely. Okay, these old guys from Greek and Roman times wrote things down. Well, their scholars today view these guys as tremendous historians. They have their own characteristics. They weren't like modern historians, but they had their own characteristics. And you know, these guys lived like some of them 400 BC, and we have one copy of this guy's writings. A copy of a copy of a copy, not his original either. It's a co one uh, one copy that was transmitted. That's not Socrates. Um, and yet, the, uh, to use a similar example, at the time of Thucydides, who lived in uh, Greece, um, hey guy lived in Palestine, okay. and uh, you know, they have uh, several copies of copies of Haggai's writings, okay. or uh, the New Testament, uh, you know, three or four hundred years later, you know, when the New Testament was written, we have dozens and dozens and dozens of copies of these manuscripts. You know, when you include the little pieces of manuscripts that have been preserved well. It runs into thousands. The Bible is unique in ancient literature. It really is unique in its far as far as its written form is concerned, showing us, you know, this is a pure illustration of divine preservation. God has kept his word. Now there are certain differences in all these manuscripts, not all of them, but when you compare all these manuscripts together, there are differences. Right, which presents a real problem. And that's 
where the science of textual criticism comes in when you compare these things. Right? So preservation actually applies to every aspect of the recordings. And this is what this paragraph is about. There are at least three aspects of history which each evidence God's preserving care over the scriptures. So that none of them, the scriptures, have been lost, changed, or added to. His canonization was his preservation of his word in full and final collection and recognition. Transmission of his word through translation and propagation was his preservation from loss and ignominy. Historical transcendence through heresy and apostasy and persecution is God's preservation in spite of opposition. Just comments about that. I think we'll leave that for today. We're in a short class this morning, because I know you guys have to study for Greek. So we have a while, but we need to make the whole statements on that, preservation of the word, some of the things. That fellow that just tried to have all the Bible and burn or something, it was on us, but it's been precedent about 100 years later for bringing in the Bible. Not burned, it was uh, Voltaire, Voltaire, French skeptic, predicted that in, in 100 years. You know, his books would be uh, read and the Bible would be forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. The other one, what came on the story, when the scholars said, forget it, they're all kind of like a like a iron things that the belts horseshoes on, and better get better feathers or something. An animal? An animal. One, one Roman uh, emperor by the name of uh, Diocletian uh, ordered full scale war on the Bible. It was a capital offense to uh, be found with the, with the Bible or a portion of the Bible. And, uh, and all that did was just proliferate the scriptures. Okay, we'll continue this in tomorrow's class. Sure, even the devil's words are uh, are recorded in scripture. And uh, we have Solomon's observations on life while he was, you know, like after he came back to the Lord, he went back and explained what his viewpoint was when he was walking contrary to God. So the doctrine of inspiration does not mean that every single word or phrase in the Bible or every source is actually perfect. But inspiration means that it was that God intended for us to have that that particular thought, whether it was right or wrong, so that we would understand it in its context. And inspiration guarantees that it's been accurately recorded. It took me a while to understand that. At first, my first views of inspiration were quite different from that. Another confusing part of the Bible in that respect is the book of Job. You have the words of Elihu and uh, Abiah. Is it Abiathar? The three Jobab or something. Yeah, the three counselors of Job. And. Uh, you know, there's some very exalted sayings by those men, but they were all rejected by God. Ultimately, God more or less threw out all their philosophy because of the overall impression. So, these documents are kind of an interesting thing. Now, I don't have the Christological content for uh, First Chronicles completed, and. So I don't want to say anything about it now. I'll just put it in the notes when I type them up. So what we could do is we could go ahead and uh, start on Second Chronicles.
So what, uh, at what point in uh, history does uh, First Chronicles conclude with, you recall? David. It takes us right up to the end of David's reign. Remember, the first nine chapters of First Chronicles are genealogies, and then in the tenth chapter we have the death of Saul. So actually there's been a number of years, what, maybe 40, 50 years of uh, monarchical history bypassed by the authors of, or the author of First Chronicles. So basically First Chronicles focuses on David, much like Second Samuel. Right? And Second Chronicles picks up with Solomon and takes us to the end of the divided kingdom. So it's obvious that the actual chronology of Second Chronicles is much greater than right, the time span. I'm not going to duplicate uh, our headings, uh, our discussion of the title and the author and the date of First Chronicles. But we will look at the major events first and, and the places and the people. As far as the important people, just make a quick note. Solomon is basically uh, the center of focus in the first nine chapters of this book, just as the first nine chapters of First Chronicles is on genealogies, the first nine chapters of the second book are on Solomon, King Solomon. Chapter 9 uh, records for us uh, Queen of Sheba's visit. And then we have the division of the kingdom. And beginning with chapter 10, you have this long list of kings, uh, and it's uh, basically, or not, although not exclusively, but primarily it focuses on Judah rather than the kings to the north. First and second kings have already taken us up to the, has already recorded for us the depressing chronicles of the tribes to the north. So it goes from Rehoboam to Abijah to Asa to Jehoshaphat. Just about every chapter has a different king. I see Rehoboam in chapters uh, 9, 9 through 12, Abijah in chapter 13, King Asa who happened to be a good king in chapters 14 through 16, Jehoshaphat, another good king, chapter 17 to 20, fairly good king. We have King Jehoram in chapter 21, Ahaziah in 22. We have Joash's reign. Remember, he was the one that was seven years old. Um, Joash, chapters 23 and 24. And then from there on, you just about have uh, chapter by chapter. Uh, the only significant reign after Joash is Hezekiah, and his reign is uh, recorded in chapters 29 to chapter 32. And this takes us uh, just about to the end. You just uh, Josiah. Um, he was... Uh, not a bad king, but uh, it was just too late by then.
Now, when you run through a list of the names uh, of the places in this book, uh, there are very few places outside of Judah. Couple, we have um, we have uh, reference to Tyre. The king of Tyre in, in in chapter two in this book, where Solomon made his contacts for temple materials. Uh, we have the plain of the Jordan, also mentioned as a source for his for some of the temple materials. Solomon's accomplishments accomplishments in chapter eight were known throughout the whole country, and in Israel, chapters 8 and 9. Ramoth Gilead in chapter 18 is kind of an interesting notation. This is where uh, King Ahab was, uh, remember he dressed up in King Jehoshaphat's armor? And uh, a Syrian arrow was supernaturally directed by God between the chinks in his armor, and he was killed. And they didn't even know it. This was Ramoth Gilead, east of Jordan. That's rather a significant departure from this otherwise uh, central focus on Judah. That's chapter 18. King Ahaz is uh, uh, predecessor uh, was from uh, Samaria, chapter uh, 27-28. We have uh, King Manasseh. Uh, taken to Babylon and then brought back as a puppet king. We have a battle uh, fought in Megiddo in chapter 35. And then the last chapter of Second Chronicles ends with the deportation to Babylon. But otherwise, every other reference in the book, outside of these seven or eight references that I've mentioned, are all to Jerusalem or Judah or to the temple. In Jerusalem, it's reference to Mount Moriah, chapter three. Okay, let's uh, let's start on the major events. Work our way through them. Yeah, do you want to wait a little bit? Okay. Well, we'll we'll pick up that next class then. We're a little bit late this morning. We just uh, forward this can to the end of the this side, so you'll be ready for uh, theology in a few moments. Okay. Thanks.